Hello and welcome to this episode of Physical Attraction. This week we'll be asking the question, is ETA the way? Let's talk about ETA's history. The idea behind this project really began in 1973, when the head of the USSR, Leonid Brezhnev, met Richard Nixon at the height of the OPEC oil crisis. They agreed that fusion energy collaboration might ease Cold War tensions, and, with the EU and Japan on board, the INTOR, that is the International Tokamak Reactor, project began. At this point, it was really just a set of meetings to discuss what might be needed for a real project to take place. In 1985, when Reagan and Gorbachev met, it was decided to actually advance this towards an engineering and design phase. In 1986, then, the US, the EU, the Soviet Union and Japan signed the ITER Agreement. The initial design of ITER was more ambitious than the version that's being constructed today. It was aimed to produce 1.5 gigawatts of power compared to current ETA's 500 megawatts of power. So this is going to be closer to what the second generation demo is supposed to produce, and to ignite the plasma as well as being the first machine to produce more energy than is supplied in heating. So compared to the original design, ETA is now only really trying to achieve half of these goals, and they're hiving off the rest of them for this demo power plant which is to follow by 2040-2050 according to the official timeline. By 1988, conceptual designs for the plant were underway, and in 1993, people were expecting to have the device ready and built by 2010. But of course, my dear, dear listener, you and I are too old to dance, and you know how setting timelines for big fusion projects tends to go. Rafi Kachadorian wrote an excellent piece in the 2014 edition of The New Yorker about ETA, when it was looking to be in quite a considerable bit of trouble. I'll quote from it now. In those early years, ETA had, for the only time in its history, a single visionary at its helm, a French physicist named Paul-Henri Rebou. Balding with intense eyes darting behind large glasses, Rebou had designed Jet, a widely praised machine with a vacuum chamber big enough to walk through. Some colleagues referred to him as a genius. He could attend to engineering obstacles with extreme focus, and was able to visualise simple solutions for intricate problems. At Jet, Rebou wandered the halls of the design office at night. He thought more clearly while pacing and sometimes he went from workstation to workstation, put penning corrections or crossing out whole ideas. He could be brutal, one of the scientists who worked with him recalled, but he was very, very clever. Once Rabu had agreed to take charge of ITER, he moved with characteristic boldness. For years, in various workshops, a conceptual design had been sketched out for a dual-purpose machine that was partly an experiment to prove fusion's feasibility and partly a prototype for a commercial reactor. Rabu tossed out the design and replaced it with his own, a gargantuan device, in effect a full prototype. In his mind, fusion was already feasible, and, as he had once explained, there is a general tendency not to be harsh enough in this field, and to go too slowly, not to make the general step large enough. He envisioned a vacuum vessel 72 feet in diameter. Its plasma would produce a gigawatt, or a billion watts, possibly more, and run for a thousand seconds at a time. He saw no point in this massive global effort without chasing the ultimate goal, ignition of a plasma. At that time, ITER had no formal organisation. Ciocchio, who is one of the sources for this article, remarked, All of us were basically assigned to this international team from our own countries. Three offices then for ITER were opened, one in Germany, one in Naka, Japan, which concentrated mostly on the magnets, and a design centre in San Diego, where Rabu was based. Often, scientists had to fly around to see each other. Rabu himself was the integrator, recalled Shikoshio. We were sending him the faxes every evening, and they were sending us responses by fax every morning. We were joking that this was a design by strategic fax, but the approach was not entirely entropic, it had an advantage. After all, instead of working 8 hours a day, we were working 16. The design was extremely elastic, features shifted continually in each other in relation to other features that were also shifting. Working at the conceptual level without worrying over fine details, they could grasp what colleagues in other divisions were doing. The plasma was constantly exerting new and unforeseen forces which the ITER engineers struggled to measure and to incorporate into their designs. The mentality of fission is that there is a systematic process. You define your loads, your criteria, and then you produce a design. At the beginning, at ITER, sometimes I would ask my boss, can you tell me what the main requirements are for this component, said the scientist. And he would say, what are you talking about? Just try to find a solution. It was a bit more of a, let's say, creative engineering environment. Rabu himself did not bother documenting the requirements. This was information that he kept easily in his head. An American representative urged him to work in a more standardised way, but he refused. The design was growing in scale and cost, 
and Raghu's intuitive style and unwillingness to engage in basic diplomacy began to work against him. In 1994, the United States succeeded in having him removed. As it was not his way to leave subtly, he went to the Congress and argued that the ETA organisation had insufficient legal authority, insufficient independent funding, and perhaps, worst of all, a leadership of incompetent bureaucrats. By focusing on consensus, he argued, the parties made decisions based on the lowest common denominator. The representatives assigned to the ETA Council were more concerned with the work awarded to each home team than the success of the whole activity. If things did not change, Rabu predicted, the machine would never succeed. So this gives you a little illustration of what happened when you have to talk about a project as large as ETA and the issues that arise from the politics, because very quickly things get a little bit out of hand. Essentially, everyone loved the idea of an international fusion reactor collaboration. They knew that their individual fusion projects would end up just replicating each other's work and that they wouldn't be able to create anything large enough to really make the strides that were now needed. But this idea poses so many of its own problems. For a start, where do you put the massive reactor? Wherever you do put it, that's where the majority of jobs will be created and where the majority of the economic benefit will be felt. Scientific funding and talent would ultimately flow from some of the ETA collaboration countries towards whichever country eventually managed to host the thing. Meanwhile, scientists in individual countries were aware that a big part of their government's fusion budget would be sucked in towards ETA. So if you're working on stellarators or different types of smaller tokamak or inertial fusion or anything else, you clearly want to oppose putting all your eggs in one basket. And if you disagree with the committee-like nature of decision-making in ETA, tough luck. Throughout the 1990s, against a background of economic recession, the budgets for science problems all over the world were slashed. In the US, for example, the magnetic confinement fusion budget was reduced from 350 million a year in 1995 to 240 million in 1996. The magnetic fusion scientists in the US were aghast. They essentially felt that this would prevent them from even contributing that much to ITER, let alone from building any new domestic machines that they'd hoped. They even said that at this level of funding, they would be unable to fully exploit the main US tokamak, the TFTR, in the years to come. But of course, these problems, these political issues are replicated in every country that is collaborating as part of this issue. In 1997, for example, Japan were undergoing a nasty economic crisis and they asked for a three-year delay in the planned construction of ITER in order for them to get their funds together in time. By 1998, the conceptual and engineering design for ITER was finished. So yes, this was designed 20 years ago, and it's still being built today. That's part of how difficult this kind of project is to get off the ground. At this point, once the design had actually been finished, it became clear that ITER would cost $11 billion to build, and that this might even be an optimistic estimate. And once that became clear, the US Congress balked. The House Appropriations Committee, you'll remember that there was a figure on the House Appropriations Committee, or possibly the Senate Appropriations Committee, I don't remember, who said, how long can you keep flogging a dead horse before you know that he's dead about fusion efforts in 1968? So in 1998, when they're being asked to contribute towards an $11 billion project that's not even going to be built in the US, you can understand why they are going to be a little bit concerned. The House Appropriations Committee, they were angry that they'd contributed 10 years and already $350 million of funding to a project that hadn't even selected a proper site for ITER. And in a sort of rage quit, they cut all their funding for the ITER project altogether. By July, the US were refusing to sign the extension to the ITER agreement, and by October, they pulled their scientists out entirely. The departure of the US, along with the problems from the other participants, was what effectively killed the initial design of ITER, and it meant that they had to scale it down. So they went for this ETA light design instead. This is the one that they're currently building. So now we have 500 megawatts of power rather than 1.5 gigawatts. It's smaller in general, and it's not aiming for ignition and sustained burn of the plasma. Remember, what the ETA is currently having as its top line result, if it does succeed, will be getting more energy out of the plasma than heating energy that's put into the plasma. Well, that's one thing. But this actual goal of ignition is that the the burn of the plasma, the fusion reactions, are producing enough energy to keep fusion going without supplying any external energy to the fusion reactor. So in the same way that a fuel burns because the energy to ignite more parts of the fuel arrive from you know burning other parts of the fuel rather than from the external match that you put to it. That's what they're sort of hoping to do with the initial eater, but the new eater won't get anywhere near to sustained burn at the moment. And this all arises because of these funding conflicts in the 1990s. 
In the meantime, those confinement fusion scientists at JET and JT-60 in Japan were trying to set records to demonstrate how close we might be to break even. So this is in the sort of late 1990s, that's when the record setting runs for JET's power production, for example, occurred. So you need to understand them as saying that at this stage they were really pushing the limits of their tokamaks and saying, look how close we are, can we perhaps use this, use these results to give the impression of progress and influence the design of ETA going forward. But for a long while, it seemed as if the departure of the US might have, if not killed, then severely delayed any hope for the ETA project and its ultimate ambitions. And throughout the ETA collaboration, the US has certainly been something of an unreliable partner. In 2017, for example, they contributed just $50 million to the project. In other words, in 2017, the United States contributed as much to the world's largest nuclear fusion project as they did to making the Emoji movie. There were ongoing battles over funding to the project. In 2018, they planned to halve the contribution again, but ended up deciding on $122 million in last-minute budget contributions, in a step that has apparently prevented further delays to ITER. I should of course point out that it's not just the United States that has been reluctant to contribute to the spiralling budget, or where politics can pose an issue in the future. As I write this, it's still totally unclear what will happen with Brexit, and given that this will probably come out within a year, that will probably still be true when you hear it. But if Britain were to leave without a deal, we would no longer be able to contribute to the ITER project in the same way as we do now, despite hosting the world's best tokamak in Oxfordshire. Anyway, all of this politics aside, the point I'm making is that concerns and tensions in ITER's international collaboration are far from over today, but they're not quite as bad as they were in the late 1990s and a few years ago, which were both crisis periods for the project where it seemed as if there was a possibility that it might have to be shelved altogether. So once after the 1990s crisis when they adopted ETA Light, and there was some not inconsiderable tweaking and lobbying to the agreement, the ETA organisation did manage to persuade some new members to join. The redesigned ETA Light was finished by 2001, and by reducing the budget to a supposed $6 billion for construction, they managed to get South Korea, China, Canada, and India to join in on the project. And in 2003, George W. Bush announced that the US would in fact be rejoining the ETA collaboration. A lot of this was driven by the fact that, squeal as the US magnetic confusion scientists might, it was increasingly becoming the only game in town for them. The big tokamak TFTR was shut down in 1997, and they ended up working on a series of much smaller devices with increasingly dwindling budgets. Ultimately, the few powers that be who could advocate for US magnetic fusion preferred to be part of the ETA project rather than dying a slow death at home. All of this was very well, but it, the fact remained that 20 years after Reagan and Gorbachev agreed on the project, they still hadn't decided where to build the damn reactor, and there was an increasingly dramatic deadlock over where to build it, with two sites ultimately narrowed down into a deathmatch, one in Japan and one in the south of France. Spain and Canada had also proposed sites. When Canada's was rejected, it left the collaboration again, and Spain were bought off by allowing them to host some of the administrative buildings for ITER. Jason Parisi and Justin Ball, in their wonderful The Future of Fusion Energy, rightly summarise that little conflict. Quote, In 2005, the negotiations concluded without even requiring a major international emergency to conclude them. In reality, though, the project was on the verge of falling apart, with increasing rumblings from all sides to get on with it, or the funding would vanish. Ultimately, then, France did win out over this battle as to where to host the tokamak, but this was as part of a big compromise deal brokered by the ITER organisation. The EU gave Japan a supercomputer, 20% of the leadership positions including ITER's Director General chip position, money to help them upgrade their domestic tokamak program, and agreed that many of the contracts for materials would come from Japanese companies. The EU also agreed to pay a greater fraction of the budget and help pay for a $600 million materials research centre which would be set up in Japan to create all of those complicated materials required for ITER to succeed. So this was a compromise that allowed the project to keep going. By 2006, then, the seven participants formally agreed to fund the creation of the reactor, only 20 years after Reagan and Gorbachev had first floated doing so. The EU as hosts would contribute 45%, with the other participants funding around 9% each. The initial plan in 2006 was to have the reactor operating by 2018 at a cost of around $7 billion. The final agreements were signed in 2007, and preparation of the site began in 2008. Of course, though, it didn't start working in 2018, and by 2014, it was clear that ITER did not have a prayer of being delivered on time and beginning experiments in 2018. The mood inside the project was very bleak at this point. 
Again, Rafi Kachadorian's wonderful profile of the ETA organization in The New Yorker really profiles it around the time that this crisis point actually bit. He wrote, quote, Morale is through the floor, and one can expect cynicism, disagreements, black humour. There is an anxiety here that it's all going to implode, one physicist told me. Many engineers and physicists at ITER believe that the delays are self-inflicted, having little to do with engineering or physics and everything to do with the way that ITER is organised and managed. Key members of the technical staff have left, others have taken a stress leave to recuperate. Not long ago, the Director General, Osamu Motojima, a Japanese physicist who has run the organisation since 2010, ordered workmen to install at the headquarters entrance a granite slab proclaiming Eater's presence. People around here call it a tombstone. So what was going wrong at Eater? Well, there were of course a number of issues. The cost of some of the key materials rose. You probably noticed that the construction started in 2008, the year of the global financial crisis, which plunged everything into uncertainty and made cash harder to come by. The initial budget was wildly optimistic, as most of these large construction project budgets are, because people estimate them based on assumptions that nothing will go wrong a lot of the time. It was never going to cost $6 billion to build. This estimate actually came from before the design was even finished, and didn't include many of the realistic costs of actually manufacturing things in the world, where things go wrong and the best laid plans tend to fall apart. And managing this huge international collaboration led to its own problems. Everyone competed over who would get to manufacture the most valuable and lucrative components for ITER. On at least one occasion, this led to outright farce. For example, Consider the central vacuum vessel that houses the tokamak. It's built up out of nine sections. So, under normal circumstances, if you're building something that has nine pieces, the same person builds all nine pieces, right? That would be a good way to make sure that they're all the same, so that they're identical. But no, for the sake of compromise, after some wrangling, the EU built seven of these pieces and South Korea built two. They needed to be identical, but South Korea's sections were designed to be welded together while the EU's used bolts. It's pretty mind-boggling that such nonsense can occur on such a big project for political reasons, but I imagine anyone listening who's worked on this kind of collaborative project before might be thinking of their own pet disaster and not finding it surprising at all. Finally, in the spirit of collaboration, there's not a great deal of central organisation. It's not really clear who has authority over everyone else. Each country has its own domestic contribution, and sometimes, as was the case with for the US with some days, they just failed to fund them. Rather than a central group with representatives from all of these nations then, there are sort of seven little ETA groups that don't always communicate with each other correctly, or even have the same amount of funding or the same motivations, which makes things difficult. Conflict between these groups, which were called domestic agencies, are a big part of why ETA was delayed so severely. For example, what if one group wants to tweak a particular part of the design that makes your part more expensive or difficult to manufacture? Well, then you have gridlock. Even getting people to coordinate across a single language or use the same scientific terminology was a struggle. When European engineers who had invested decades of research on tokamak inner walls proposed building eaters inner wall, a Chinese official stood and, deeply upset, argued vehemently that it was the height of arrogance to presume that China could not manufacture a wall. And so it was decided that China would make part of the wall. Other problems arose along the way, associated with the manufacture of individual components. Remember that central solenoid, the one that continues to crack slightly with every pulse, this huge magnet that's providing a big part of the toroidal field? When it was first designed by Japanese manufacturers, it could only last for 6,000 pulses, one-tenth of what it was supposed to. Eventually the cable was modified and refined, and it was successful, but not before there was considerable concern that this might prove impossible to build, and with a two-year delay in the, this component's manufacture. Meanwhile, the concrete for the floor had to be precisely levelled to within centimetres. I mean, even things like this can provide a lengthy building and engineering challenge by themselves. In 2014, then, there was a very damning internal report about ITER that was leaked to the press. It criticised the lack of project management inside ITER. In one particularly damning passage, it said... We were unable to observe a sense of urgency, a passion for success, a commitment to rapidly finding solutions for problems, or an agile or nimble project organisation. The report criticised everything, from the initial overambitious schedule, to the decision-making progress, to the lack of good management, through to the lack of communication within the organisation. There was no shortage of smart and dedicated people working at ITER. But as I'm sure you will all appreciate, that doesn't mean that you don't have a totally dysfunctional organisation when you put all of those smart and hard-working people together. 
Loyal listeners will think back to our Buzzkill episodes where I talked about the economics of fusion and how even the big fission plants are subject to costing billions of dollars and overrunning their schedules by years and years. The truth is that these huge mega projects are almost always subject to the same problems. A big part of it is sunk cost fallacy, which is also wonderfully detailed in the Cacciadorian article. The deputy director, who by the way denies making this comment, supposedly is rumoured to have said, if you spend as much money as you can, after the first billion, no one is going to stop us. One former ITER engineer reported the uh, conversation that's having taken place. I mean, this is not unique to Fusion, of course. Here in the UK, we have plenty of projects that are horribly delayed and horribly over budget. I mean, one good example would be the high-speed railways. Another good example would be the actual fission power plants that we're building at the moment. And ITER, for all that it represents a remarkable achievement and a wonderful vision, is a textbook example of the problems that plague building huge facilities. And this is another factor that comes into our buzzkill theory in the buzzkill episodes, is that lots of these problems actually don't exist to the same extent when you're building smaller modular renewables or technical achievements that have been done before. I mean, if you're putting out solar panels in a field, there are fewer things that can go wrong because there are fewer things that need to come together. If you run out of money, then your solar plant might only be half of what it was before. It's not an all or nothing in the same way that a huge multi-multi-billion dollar project like ETA is. And of course, a lot of this is going to compromise the design of the project as you go along. Pressure over the budget and the timescale of ETA have led to the design being changed. One example is in handling neutrons. So the team are trying to figure out how to assemble all of these components, and every little change that they make counts, because every little change can determine how many neutrons are going to smash into particular parts of the apparatus. If the neutron pressure on sensitive parts is too high, then they'll simply have to turn ETA's temperature down until it can operate safely without destroying the most vulnerable part of the device. Even now, it's difficult to predict what the final performance of ETA might end up being, and whether it can sustain that performance without damage to the reactor itself. If ETA could achieve 10 times power gain, but not without destroying its interior, that would be a horrible irony, but it would also suggest much more work for future reactors. Similarly, ETA's original design called for two diverters, that is, two large, sort of, mostly metal things that they put in there that are designed to divert the hot particles away uh, from the plasma itself. And two diverters means that the heat flux on each of the diverters is going to be less, which means hopefully that your machine will be able to operate at higher temperatures, because it's essentially the diverter melting that sets the limit at where your machine can operate. ETA's original design had two diverters, and now they're just going with one. So I really don't care to imagine for too long what it must have been like to work in this organisation when it was undergoing all of this criticism and media scrutiny. Especially because, as I'm sure you'd agree, fusion research attracts a certain kind of person. You don't have to be like this, but chances are there'll be part of you that's idealistic, you'll be interested in the dream of contributing to this vast cathedral-like undertaking that solves the world's energy problems and propels humanity into a new golden age. Also, you've dedicated your career to this pursuit. If you start working on ETA in 1990 or 2000, expecting it to start experimenting in 2018, the idea that the project might get delayed by a decade or cancelled altogether is immensely concerning to you as an individual. You'll have spent literally decades in some cases working on it. The mismatch between the timeline and the delays, the expectation and the reality, and the huge amount riding on such a vast scientific project, it must have been very difficult and stressful for everyone involved. It was clear in 2014 that something had to give, and indeed something did. The management team were removed and replaced by a new manager, Bernard Bigot of France, in 2015, with the goal of turning the project around. ITER admitted that it would not succeed in its original goal to achieve fusion experiments by 2018, and they adopted a new timetable, first plasma in 2025, first DT experiments in 2035. The tokamak itself is currently under construction. With the new, delayed timetable and new management, there's generally more optimism about the potential for the project to succeed, although it will almost certainly wind up costing more than was expected. I mean, it's currently estimated to cost around 17 billion euros or 20 billion dollars in construction costs, and then it will cost 300 million dollars a year to run for the 20 years that it runs, followed by a decommissioning phase that might set you back another billion euros. So we're realistically talking about a total cost for the project that will end up being at least 30 billion dollars, and ultimately, no one knows how much it will eventually end up costing. And this is a far cry from the 6 billion or the 9 billion that they were throwing around at the start of the project. 
come ask me in 2050 what it actually costs. At present, the construction phase is estimated to be around 60% complete. And the work is ongoing. As I write this, I can tell you that the most recent development is that the big cryogenic lower chamber for the magnets has just been lowered into the tokamak pit. And this is the single largest component of ITER that's finally been put in place. I cannot honestly tell you whether ITER will succeed in some or all of its primary science goals, or like NIF will be remembered for falling short of its promises. As I'm sure you'll appreciate with every new machine component that's introduced, there's potential for things to go wrong or for delays to occur. I would be not necessarily surprised, but I think relieved, if a project of this complexity works the first time that it's switched on. And I would be pleasantly surprised if there weren't any further delays to the big roadmap that has been sketched out at the moment. It would represent an incredible triumph if, 40 years after it was first proposed by Reagan and Gorbachev, ITER lights up with plasma, and, 10 years after that, it successfully achieves its design performance in DT fusion. It would be a scientific cathedral the culmination of decades of work on behalf of thousands of people. Of course, you may be thinking that these are reasons why fusion will not make a commercial energy source, if this is what's required to build one reactor. Will it work? I don't know. Will it provide a commercial path to fusion energy by 2050? Of that I'm even less willing to be sure. But am I excited to find out what will happen? Of course. Am I terrified in equal measure that something might go wrong? Of this there's no doubt. I guess we'll all have to find out together, and if this show is still running by then, I'll be sure to keep you posted. Thanks for listening to this episode of Physical Attraction. We've taken you from the very dawn of fusion energy as an idea, right up until the present day. Well, nearly. Alongside ITER and the mainstream narrative of fusion, there are a vast array of fascinating startups who are currently aiming to achieve the same goal by very different, and, they hope, more commercially viable means. So over the next few episodes, we'll be discussing Fusion's dark horses. Do any of these startups have what it takes to build a star? And then it will be time for us to conclude this truly epic journey that we've been on together. We'll take a look at what we've learned and talk about the possible future of Fusion Energy, and overall just try to take it all in and figure out precisely what on earth has just happened and where we're going next. Until then, there are plenty of things you can do to keep up with the show. You can visit our website at www.physicspodcast.com where there's a contact form, any comments, questions, concerns, ideas for future episodes, send them all there. It's great to hear from you. You can follow us on Twitter at PhysicsPod, and the Facebook page is Physical Attraction. Until next time then, take care. Thank you.